been asked to give a lecture at Birkbeck University, London. But while sitting in the audience for another lecture, we were told that the lecturer had cancelled. After being spotted in the audience, I was then asked by the organisers if I would be able to stand in and give a spontaneous lecture there and then. What you're about to hear is a recording of that spontaneous lecture, loosely entitled An Introduction to the Occult Art of Law. I kind of set upon this subject called law. I found it very interesting. One of the first guys I met was a guy called John Harris. Some of you may know him. He's uh, passed away uh, last year and we became friends. It was only through knowing him and doing a lot of research that I realised just how much hold law has over us and our lives and the way we think and the assumptions we, we make. There's a whole different language. It's known as legalese. It sounds like English, but it isn't. It's got very specific, well-defined meanings, which is why it takes so long to get a legal qualification. And I guess I'd better start at the beginning. On one side you've got law, and on the other side you've got legal. And they're two entirely different things. Never the twain shall meet, really. To make it quite simple, all acts, statutes, instruments, and what is legal is not law. It's only given the force of law if you consent. Okay? So that just goes on to one side. Legislation are the rules of a corporation, whereas law is kind of natural. It's something you're born with. It's like, as a child, you most of us know the difference between right and wrong. It's one of those reasons why I guess they don't want to teach law in school because children already know the difference between right and wrong. I mean, if you were going to be taught what law was, then you'd know the difference between right and wrong and you'd be able to see through the kind of society we're living in now. So there are good reasons why they don't want to teach you law from a very young age. Believe it or not, we used to have a culture that did teach law at a very young age, um, but that was you know, quite a few thousand years ago now, and you've got to do quite a serious bit of digging to find that. So law is what we have. The last vestiges of that are what's known as common law. And, and if you ask a lawyer what law is, he'll probably say, well, law is law. But law is basically rules, maxims, bars, that have remained uncontested over time. Right, that's the important bit. They've been uncontested over time. So what we have now, let's go through some, some of these words and I'll translate them into English and then you can see how profound their meaning really is. If we take the first one, the first word is registration. We, we're told to registrate so many times. We buy a piece of software, it's not going to work until we register it. Uh, our cars registered, our children are registered, um, all kinds of things were registered. This word, we letting somebody know that we exist or something when we register, we register to vote. What does it mean in legal terms? It's very specific meaning. When you register something, you are giving away whatever you are registering to whoever you're registering it with. Let that sink in because it's really profound. Register means you are giving away whatever you are registering to whoever you're registering it with. So you buy a piece of software, it doesn't work until you register it. So you register it, which means you're giving it away. And they're saying, okay, well you can have it back with a magic secret code, but only under our terms and conditions of use. What we'll do is we'll grant you a license. And if you're in breach of that license, then there's consequences for that. Sounds bizarre, isn't it? You buy something, you think, well, that's mine. I'll buy that, it's mine, it's fine. Uh, no, in order to, to read it, you've got to give it back, but I've already paid for it. And when you read it, there are terms and conditions in, applied to how you read it, and maybe what information you divulge from what you've read. So you can see it's a way of tying you up. But let's go on a bit further. Let's look at this word application. It's one of those things we do a lot. I to get a job. Application. 
17th century translation to that, as it is today, application means you are a beggar. And it's presumed you know what you're giving up in order to get what you're begging for. Submit. It's not like, oh, I'll submit this to you. Submit means you bend to another's will. So if you submit an application to register, what you've done in terms of legal is you've given up all your rights voluntarily. Because remember there's laws against slavery, but there isn't any law against voluntary slavery. We've been deceived, and it is a deception, it's an immaculate deception really, when you start getting to the bottom of it. But let's go to the next bottom line here. What else do you register? Well, you register your birth, don't you? Your birth is registered and you get a certificate. And if you look at that certificate, and it's an incredible document, really, when you start reading it with legal eyes, you just think, oh, it's got the mother's name in it. It hasn't got the mother's name. It says informant. And on the back of it, remember, it's got the Crown Corporation logo on it. By the way, the Crown is a corporation. It's not the Queen. On the back of it, it says, this is not proof of identity. Well, you think how many documents are derived from that birth certificate? Your driving license, your passport, your NHS thing, all of it comes from it. So if it's not proof of identification, what does it mean legally? So you're kind of left with this conundrum. Well, 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 well I've, I've registered my birth, I've got this bond back. Bond. Bond is an abbreviated word. Where do you think the word bond comes from? It's really obvious. It comes from bondage. You've been registered. When you register something, you give something away. You've been given into bondage to the Crown Corporation. This is legally what it means. If you're given into bondage to the Crown Corporation, and we can prove it because there's a certificate that says that's the case, what does that mean? What's the bottom line here? Well, I'll go back to a little bit of history now. I haven't got anything behind me. But those of you who used to play Monopoly probably can remember that a pound sign used to kind of be like this and it had two lines through it. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And the dollar sign had kind of like this S and it had two lines through it. So it had two lines through it. Now, the pound used to be called sterling. It was called sterling for a reason and it was based on silver. And of course, in America, the dollar had the same two lines through it, and it was all the silver dollar. That was what it was. But in 1929, the banks owned everything. They owned absolutely everything because of a thing called the Wall Street crash, which they brought about into existence. And then they also changed things. They changed the pound sign, so it had one line through it, and the dollar sign, so it had one line. So they removed one line. Well, if the banks owned everything, the money in circulation then has a different value. There's something else backing it. If silver isn't backing it anymore, what is backing it? And around about the same time in 1933, a guy called Colonel House, who worked for the Rothschilds banking cartel, among other people, came up with this idea of registration. And he's quoted as saying, not one in a million people will work this out. Because they had to, or if the banks own everything, then the country's bankrupt. They have to find a way of carrying on business and commerce, don't they? So they need something else that, that's backing that currency. And the way that it works, and I'll give you a process, because I'm a, a shrink as well, but like I, I'll give you a process. We deal with things in terms of process, because you can get lost in content, which is the detail of things. So if I was, say, for example, uh, a dairy farmer, I'm a dairy farmer, and the bank says, sorry, Alan, you know, we've made all the money we can, we're going to foreclose on you, you're bankrupt. But good news is we'll keep you on as a manager, seeing as you know a bit about what you're doing. So we now own your farm, and you now work for us. But what we'll do is for every calf that's born, we'll extend you credit based on the milk and cheese and meat that it's going to produce in its lifetime. You register that calf with us and we'll extend you credit based on the milk and cheese and meat it's going to produce in its lifetime. Well, you are the cattle. 
you are those coarse because when your births were registered money, it's called a fiat currency is put into circulation and it's based on the wealth that you can create in your lifetime your labour that's basically what it is but I tend to look at that term as your sweat equity so that's what backs currency it promise, it's a promissory note a promissory note is a negotiable instrument banks deal in negotiable instruments it gets worse, believe you me it gets worse and I'm probably going a little bit too far but I guess the point of this talk is to hopefully stimulate you guys to do your own research so if I can throw enough stuff at you and go what that guy said can't be true, it can't possibly be true I'd say I'll welcome you do your own research and find this out for yourself because the more people that know this how we're caught in this situation the more people that have the knowledge about it the easier it will be for us to get out of this trap it does get worse, it gets much worse actually when you look at it for example there's a thing with, that goes along with the birth certificate a bond is created obviously, a contract and that's worth money the original title of this talk was going to be the occult significance of law because most people don't think um, there is anything occult about law at all and those that would do any research would go oh that's absolute rubbish Alan, that can't possibly that I'll totally reject that and by rejecting it lose the opportunity to begin to comprehend what's really going on because there is a very strong occult aspect to law and the reason they dress the way they do and the terminology and the language that they use as well in fact it's very much an occult art it is in fact the occult art of law to be a member of the Bar Association goes back to Venice the Venetians which isn't a million miles away phonetically from the Phoenicians who were kind of a race of pirates around the Mediterranean as well and we have our laws are broken down into different forms of laws and one of them is called the law of the sea and one of them in the British Empire was known as Admiralty Law as well so it's very much the law of the sea the law of business, the law of commerce, the law of money, the law of trading trading in slaves, trading in bales and bonds and surety in fact the word courtio which is where we derive the word court from in Roman times means to deal in bonds and surety if you wanted justice you'd go to the Basilica that's where you would get justice not a court court just deals in bales and bonds the bench is a place if I'm a king and I own a market pace I've got my my guys who are on my firm there they've got a bench and they settle the disputes in the marketplace in the bonds and the sureties what goes on there if someone sold something it's been underweight then my guys come in and they decide what to do and if you want to trade in that marketplace you sign a contract you have to be allowed you get a license to trade remember I say you register you know something's given to you it's taken back to you there are now terms and conditions if you want to trade you have to register your business you have to give it all away and it all comes under one heading one big pyramid under the top of it the Crown Corporation they own it all, all the businesses the whole thing, they own it all, it's registered to them they decide what goes on they own the money that you have you think this is my money in my pocket it isn't, it's a promissory note and your tax, some of the tax you pay is the rent for using that it's theirs, they own it all it makes sense when it's explained like this you know, people say, oh, I'm not going to pay any tax, I'm going to keep this and they, well, you're, it's rent for the, their money, they own you and the occult aspect of it is that they own your mind your body, and believe it or not they believe these guys are completely off their dials your soul this is why they have all the gold because gold is an immortal metal this is why they like the precious they like all that, that gold that's why they hold it all and that's why they circulate money they now own everything they have you in bondage it's a slave 
based society and it's a voluntary slave based society you've volunteered you've entered into a contract so when you go for example it even gets worse you're part of a believe it or not a death cult the three forms of law the first is the uniform commercial code the second is canon law the holy see and the highest form of law believe it or not in this country is Talmudic law Babylonian Talmudic law okay so the first form of law deals in bonds and surety and you as a slave and as you're owned they can do exactly what they like to you and that's exactly what they do they extend the credit based on the milk and cheese all right so you register to vote I'm just outlining stuff here to hopefully stimulate your own research you register to vote means you're giving away whatever you're registering to whoever you're registering it with so what's the process here let's just look at the difference what happens when you vote you go in there and they give you a bunch of guys you can vote from this and they say to you you've got to put an X on the box don't they and you follow that and you put an X on the box only incompetence or illiterate people sign with an X and what you do when you register to vote you say I'm giving up my responsibility I'm illiterate and I agree I'm a mental health outpatient and I'll prove this by marking an X on this and what I do I will give whoever I put that X against power of attorney you're giving them power of attorney over your life in other words if you were some old guy in a mental hospital who's lost his marbles and the, the lawyer says he can't manage his affairs anymore we've got to give someone power of attorney to manage all his finance to do everything for him and they get him to sign and now you've given power of attorney that person manages your life so not only do they own you mind body and soul you've now voluntarily registered and giving them power of attorney over your life so you basically say to them I'm a mental health outpatient which is why you vote in a ward because it's a giant mental asylum you're in a ward if you prove to them that you you're in a litter you put the X on there and you registered to vote you've given away your rights and now you've given them power of attorney in other words you say to them I've let you decide what you think is best for me if we were on a war that's fine I've got no say in it and what they will do is like should we say the deranged young son who's managing has got power of attorney over his great grandmother <clears throat> spending all the money on drugs and resources like that he'll tell her what she wants to hear Ooh, what do these politicians do they'll tell you what you want to hear that's the way they're playing the game above a mental health outpatient which you've proved yourself to be in their game is the house of commons they're commoners so you're less than a commoner people come to me and they say oh about the Magna Carta Alan that gave us all the rights and all the other stuff the Magna Carta deals with baron baron French for free man you're not free you're a bonded slave Magna Carta is only pertinent and has any meaning to somebody who's not a bonded slave so you'd have to be in the House of Lords today to be able to have any power or sway with the Magna Carta as a baron as a free man and the House of Commons people like David they're less than that and you're right down there you've got no rights at all you voluntarily gave them up you're a mental health outpatient that's given away power of attorney on a regular basis to a different bunch of guys who tell you what you want to hear and they lie to you over and over again how much more proof can you give them that you've lost the plot this is the way they look at it this is the way they trick you this is the way they deceive you this is the way because the way the universe works is they don't want the blame of it they say, it's not us look I'll prove it to you look they signed here this is your signature signature that's another one signature means sign of nature you proved a li yourself to be a living being and you've made a mark on a piece of paper called a signature that proves you've got a sign of nature because they've created a thing called a person person means legal fiction legal fiction means you become liable all your bills are written to you in capital letters everything to do with money bank rent commerce everything is you in capital letters addressed to you in capital letters 
This is where you get the term capitalism from. Because your life has been monetized and capitalized as a bonded slave. You are what backed that currency. And you've given them power of attorney. You've given them power. You can moan, you can whinge all you like. But they'll, they'll just say no to the universe in their, their magical system. Sorry, but it's not on us. You signed, you gave us your signature, isn't it? You voted for that, you registered it. It's on you. You're responsible. It's on you. You made that decision. Not on us. We don't inherit the karma. Because the whole system works on an occult way on curses. It's an old curse system that goes back 5,000 years. It's dark magic. It's based on curses. It's based on sacrificing. It's based on blood sacrifice and all that stuff. Cursing. That's what it is. What do you think that money is? It's a curse based on your life that's been taken from you, you've been hoodwinked out of it. I mean, hoodwinked, that's a 33 and a third degree mason maybe will tell you. But you've been hoodwinked. And they're lifting the veil and they say, what I'm telling you is part of that, that process. How do you think these guys get away with stuff? If I say to you, what's your name and you give me your name, you've basically said in legalese, oh, I'll contract with you and I'm a bonded slave. I don't have any rights. I gave them up. But if you want to think on your feet, and I'm a police officer and I say, what's your name? And you say, what makes you think I have such a thing? Ask the question, because if you're asking, you're as king. You've got some status then. Because they all work, they act, and they behave in a manner, it's called implied right of consent. They are going to behave in a manner that suggests to them that you've all consented, and unless you rebut that consent, Unless you stop that, unless you say, hold on a minute, I'm not consenting, I do not consent to this, I am not a name, I'm standing under common law, if you want a contract, I'll be happy to contract with you, my fee is £900 an hour, do we have a contract, yes or no? What's he going to do? I know a guy, you can find it on uh, the YouTube thing, drunk and driving, he's driving his car drunk, the police pull him over, they say, what's your name? He says, I'll be happy to accept your offer of service. My fee is £900 an hour. Well, right, we'll arrest you then. Because that's what they normally do. They'll kidnap you until you give them your name. If you get caught on a train and you haven't got a ticket, they'll kidnap you until you give them the name. Because they want what's a thing called joinder, which is your name and address and your birth date. Because they want your bond. They want the details of your bond. They want that for a very good reason. And I'll get back to that in a minute. So he goes, he gets arrested, he goes in there, and eventually they, the sergeant's there, and oh, we've got this guy, he won't give us our name, I'll put him in the cell, then he's drunk, da 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 da. They let him go the next day. You are either. Yeah, the point is, is that they let him go. The reason, here's another one, that this, this, this really mind blowing the way the whole stitch up goes, is that bond that was created at your birth, there's a thing. It's a fancy French word, it says Sester KV, which means for the benefit of another. It was something that was created after the Great Fire of London. When they were trying to find out all the dead people, all those people that were missing and all the other stuff. And, but on one side, but on the other side, they were trying to raise a new form of currency, of credit. Because remember these guys, these Templars had done it before. How do you think they financed those big, nice Gothic cathedrals and all the rest of that with their money lending international banking scams and all that but that's another history but in 1666 after the fire of London they created a Sester KV trust the way they work it in terms of uh, the occult side they say okay you're born you're created by the divine and therefore you inherit the earth and you inherit in abundance. If you can go on the internet, you can check it out. If we lived in the, the whole planet, 7 billion people lived in the same population density as Paris, we'd take up less than half the size of Texas. All the rest of that space on the planet would be left there. That, that would be us. It would probably be crowded and horrible and all the rest of it, but that's about it. So you inherit, if you want to work it out, I, I took the time and trouble to do it actually. If you looked at it, you can do it online. Work out all the nice, arable, usable land, not the desert this guy was trying uh, to claim, but that's there now, divided by 7 billion people. Each one individual gets four 
areas the size of Twickenham rugby field. All right, and that's good. That's that's your birthright. Exactly, that's four Twickenham-sized bits of dirt. That's your birthright. But of course, your mother registered you, so they take that asset, don't they, off you? That's your birthright. It's taken from you straight away. But what they do is they monetize it because they monetize you and that asset. And that asset is supposedly from some researchers, I can't confirm it, but I know one, there's one lady that came here, she actually managed to find it, around about two million pounds. So you've got an account that you don't know anything about that's worth about two million pounds in today's money. And what happens is this. When your uh, electricity bill comes through, this is like this little check thing at the bottom, isn't there? It looks like an old-fashioned check, and it's got like three banks on it. Could Santander, National Westminster, or something like that. And it, and it says take it to a post office, fill it out, and stamp it, and all the other stuff. Okay, here, here's a little secret for those who aren't headwinked. Every debt that you incur with a corporation is zeroed, or settled, because remember, it's not real money, it's, it's credit, in 90 days. So any registered company that have got joinder, your name and address and your birthday, can apply to the Crown and settle that debt. And what they do, and this is what's financing the corporate takeover of the planet, is they get their bills paid for twice. They get it paid by the corporation, because corporations can print their own promissory notes or bills of exchange and negotiable instruments. But what they do is they get it from the second way of funding, which is the money they put into circulation, which is your sweat equity. So they get paid from your bond account, which you don't know anything about, and they get paid by the money that you've had to go and work for and you pay that bill off. So they get paid twice. And corporations, that's what they do. And the guys that are high up um, in the financial aspects of those corporations know this stuff. I've dealt with them. You know, and you can, you can play this stuff. You can say to the council tax or whatever it is, oh, that's already been paid, it's, it's 90 days, it's outstanding, it's been done. Tell, prove to me that it wasn't. It hasn't been paid for. And they can't. Because what they're doing is they're technically committing a fraud. Because they're asking, it's a fraudulent, isn't it? If I say, it's cost that much, and you've already paid for it, and I try to get you to pay for it twice, it's fraud, isn't it? For the normal people. Double bubble, isn't it? It's called double bit tipping. Okay, but this is all part of the system that we're living in. You've got all this stuff, all those rights, all that economic power. The corporations are playing a game when I was a kid, it used to be called Piggy in the Middle. Corporations one side, and they've got this account, and they throw it over you, because we're down here like that. And the other one catches it. Thanks for the money, I've got that. And you don't even know you've got that account. The occult aspect of it, again, is like when you have to go to, to court, you're actually being invited to a, a dark ritual, which is why you're summonsed. You're summoned to appear. Like you're some sort of ghost or a spirit, because that's what they think you are. Because that trust that's worth money... They don't tell you about it, but you could have reclaimed that within seven years. But after seven years, the law of salvage comes along and the government say, okay, well, that's, that's a wreck, well, we'll have that. So they salvage that and they use that. So you can't get it anymore. Even though they know in the real world you're alive and flesh and blood, you know, because you've got your national insurance thing, uh, you know, you go to the NHS, they know you're physical, you know, they'll take blood from you, all the other stuff. This occult system doesn't see it. They're off their dial, these guys. Unless we begin to see that this is what's really going on, instead of just going, oh, no, this is just sounds, this is just preposterous, absolutely preposterous. How can this possibly be the case? Unless we kind of just, you know, open up our horizons a little bit, honesty, open-mindedness and willingness, and go, okay, well, I'll entertain this for a while. I'll do a bit of research and see if there's anything what this crazy guy was talking about. Do it yourself. Check it all out. You're, you're summoned to appear in a court. Why are you summoned? Because as far as they're concerned, you didn't collect that account within seven years. So there, you're four, you're presumed dead. So if there's any liability, then they have to summon you. Because that's what you are. You're a spirit. 
I know it sounds absolutely barking, raving mad, doesn't it? But this is the way they do it. Because the way these guys work is, and they've had many, many years to do this, they know if they can control your mind, then your body will follow. And they will, con they will use all manner of things. Just around the corner of here, there's a thing called the Tavistock Institute. Those of you that do a bit of research or do a bit of shrinky stuff like me, no, it really does some good work, but it's got some extremely dark aspects to it. And its whole founding is extremely dark. It's about mind manipulation. And really, when you start realizing how you're controlled in this system, they don't mind what religion you believe in. There is only one religion. And that's the religion of money. And they want you to believe in that more than anything else. That's what they're selling you, is that religion. You can go one day a week, if you like, to your church or whatever it is you go to and feel good about yourself. That's great, because as long as you go back the extra five days and you work, because that's your worth, that's your offering. You are handing over your will and your life to the God money. Um. Well, those people who don't know it yet, the word mortgage comes from Lamo, death grip. Death grip, that's where it comes you buy, from. You buy one house, you have the six. By the time you pay the last installment, your life is finished. Things you brought up the mortgage thing. Say you decide you're going to buy a house in London, so you need a million quid at least, right, oh. you, to buy a house in London. Oh. So you go in there, you go to the bank, and the bankers are the high priests of Baal. That's right, yeah. All right, God money. They're the high priests. And they sit you down and go, oh, you want to borrow some money? Well, the first thing they want to know is they're putting a scam on you, is what's your sweat equity worth? What do you earn as a slave? How much are you worth as a slave? So the first thing they do is they'll say, okay, we'll get you to sign this. And what they do is they get you to sign, remember, sign of nature, a promissory note. And they've got your name and they've got your address. So they take that promissory note and they put it in an account. And they, out of thin air, create a million pounds. Yeah. They always do it double dealing, double bookkeeping. They've got your bond that you don't know you have, and they've got all your details. So if, if you die, that's okay. That exists. It's got currency. And then they'll talk you into an insurance policy. It's called a life insurance policy. That's the one they'll like as well. So you go into the bank, and you, your signature has created a million pounds. Okay. All right. So... In effect, you've actually already bought the house. Right, but then what they do is they talk you into paying another million pounds, which they call the principal. They deceive you by saying that we're lending you this million pounds. So you've gone into the bank as a sovereign, created, living, being, soul, flesh, blood, inheritance and everything. The signature's created one million pounds. They've got an undertaking from you now to work for the rest of your life to create another million pounds and they're going to charge you interest on that as well so you've created two million pounds plus whatever interest they want to put on the top of that what have the bank risked? a big fat zero but then that's the religion isn't it? because they get you to go out there you are handing over something of value on a daily basis when you clock in or you go to work, you're giving the most valuable thing that you've got, your time, your life. That's you paying homage to their God. Okay, you can go one day a week somewhere else and believe that you're doing something else, but physically in your reality, you've got no choice. You're in bondage. You want to talk about freedom? Tell me how long you're going to last without money in your pocket. And then you see how much freedom you've got. <coughs> That's the reality. That belief is so powerful. I mean, if you were to get £100,000 in news notes and just throw it on any street, Trafalgar Square or somewhere like that, you'd see complete insanity. You'd see total violence breaking out. I've worked in rehabs. I specialised in the treatment of addictive clients, you know, drug addicts, alcoholics. And their parents would come in and they would say to me, well, he's done detox, he's done his cold turkey, surely he's, those cravings are gone. You know, he's not physically addicted to it anymore. I said, oh, no, 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 no. And they look at me like this. I said, no, 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 it's a psychological addiction is the most important thing. I said, they're addicted to a mood and mind-altering substance. And they said, well, but we don't understand, you know, if as long as he doesn't drink anymore, as long as he doesn't 
do any more heroin, he'll be fine. You know, that, that's what changes his mood and his mind. And I say, okay, here's a table. I'll put a wee baggie, a smack, some brown on the corner there, a bit of coke, a bit of marijuana, a bit of nice grass, a nice sticky bud, say, something like that would be nice. Some bottles of Moët Chandon, eh? Some Nuit Saint-Georges. Uh, a few bottles of Rioja. All right, if you want, a couple of tins of tenants. Or special brew. What would you like? And they go, oh no, we're not really interested in anything else. I'll tell you what, I'll put five ground in used 20s. Oh, oh that would be nice. How would that make you feel? And they go, oh yeah, that would make you feel great. I say, okay, all these other substances, if you imbibe them, there's a chemical reason that's going to change your mood and your mind. But you're telling me this printed paper is going to make you happy? is going to change your mood and your mind. Watch them on the game shows when they win something. Yeah. Watch them with the gambling. Watch them. That's a mood and mind altering substance that's more powerful than all the other ones on the table. Because all the other ones on the table, you can get rid of that addiction. You don't have to be addicted to that. There's ways around that addiction. But that other addiction, that psychological addiction, you try getting along without that one. Even if you want to, even if you try not to, it's probably the hardest addiction that there is. Exactly, exactly. So that's what you're kind of dealing with in terms of the mind programming and the addiction. Now it sounds really dark and gloomy and all the rest of it, but there is a solution and really the solution is it's always been there and this is probably why it's going to sound a bit cheesy and corny, that the solution is a thing called a spiritual program. is to reclaim your soul, your sense of value, your sense of worth. You know, and there are plenty of spiritual programs out there that don't demand you give them shed loads of money and all the other stuff. In fact, if you want to find the genuine ones, they'll be the ones that won't be wanting the money for you because they'll be on that spiritual program themselves. And there will be one out there, if you really want it, that will fit itself perfectly to what you are. I know one. Yeah, well, there's one that will suit you, there's one that suits everybody here, but what you have to do, and this, this was the one that got me when I worked in rehabs, the reluctance that people would have to pray. There's a meaning in this word, pray. It's because part of our social program is we have a I'm going to get a bit shrinky now, we have what's called a reflective action of consciousness that's us thinking, we're reflecting we're not in the moment, it's a reflective action of consciousness, and what tends to orchestrate that and it's pre-programmed to a certain extent, and it's hardwired in, it's a thing called an ego it's our, certainly my old adversary, self-importance which of course is what the whole money thing gets you in. It's got statutes. Statutes are about status. That's where you get the term statutes from. Act. It's an act. It's not true. It's a fiction. You've been caught. You've believed in a fiction. You believe you're something that you're not. It's a deception. So you're trying to get back to who you really are and what you were really created here to do. And the thing is, is like when it gets to the making money thing, it's all about competition, isn't it? Dog eat dog, all that stuff. And you can sell anything, you know, you can sell arms, prostitution, drugs, the whole thing. The more money you have, this has been around ever since human beings have been around. So there is a way out. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what mine is, but I found that way out. And I'm sure if you really want to, you can find your way out. But you have to do it, because at the end, you won't, as I found, you won't find any kind of real value in that money material thing. You have to be true to yourself. You know, that's the important thing. A human being could mend a bird's broken wing and make the desert green again. We have that ability. It's been given to us. There's a difference between given and grant. There's an aspect of you which has been given to you. In other words, you do what you like with it. That aspect of you that has been granted is finite. And that's your life in this particular realm and this dimension. You don't know how long you got. And you're willingly to sacrifice it to get 
money and stuff like that, you know, and, all, and to be part of this system. And it's, it's, you know, who can blame you? We're all born into this. We don't know any better. Most of us, it's taken us years. I mean, it took me out, I was about 40 years of age when I managed to sort of really get over the, the shock of being born. You know, you know, really to sort of get it all together in perspective. What the hell's going on? What's all this about? All that stuff that wasn't mine that had been dumped on me, and I was going, well, no, that's not mine, that's that, I don't want that, you know, that's, uh, right, this is mine, that's mine, that's who I am, right, I'm going to do that. I'll Because, be, you know, you, if you're true to yourself, then a pathway will open up to you, you know. It, it will find its way if you connect to the universe in that way. Because remember, these guys that have created this spell, they know how the universe works. They've got a way of doing this dark magic and keeping you in the dark. The first solution you need is to learn, is to get some knowledge. The stuff that I've told you, learn that. I'll give you some links at the end. You can do your own research because then when you see what I've told you, it's true. You need that because once you've got that, then you go, well, now you find a way out of here. You need to realize what your prison's like, how you got in there in order to find a way out, how the door works and stuff like that. And you've always got two options. You can turn around and go, hey, I know this stuff. I'll, really, I'll screw the system now. I'll get as much money as I can out of it. I know guys that do that. They learn all this legal, all this law stuff and everything, and they, they pass you know, promissory notes and negotiable instruments. They run frauds. What do you think these guys that are running things do in the city of London, what that place is all about? It's horrendous. Yeah, you can do that if you know what's going on. Or you can be true to yourself. You can say, no, this isn't what I want. I want to get back to this, what I'm supposed to be here, whatever that is. But I'm going to try and find out what that is. Which means I've got to let go of this. So whatever that standard of living I had before, whatever it was based on, I might have to take a, a different set of life choices and, and find out what that is. And at the same time, you need to start following your heart and not the head. Because this is what fools you, is up here. You have to follow your heart. I'll say the G word and you think I know what, what I mean there. For some people, there are other people would say the great spirit, other people would say love, other people would say love is what animates the fabric of the universe and what animates you if you allow it to do so and you truly want it to do so. If you really want it to do so and you, you see what's going on here, you say, look, I don't want any part of that, I want to change that. I want to start taking responsibility. I don't want to be somebody that's given their life away, that's a, a mental health outpatient. I'm letting the, this system make up their mind for me. In an asylum, I just continually moan because I haven't made it my business to find out what's really going on. Even though in my heart, I felt something's wrong. I mean, all of you are here because you're looking for something. You're looking for something different. You've come here because what's out there X factors, you know, all that other stuff on the telly and all the other stuff isn't giving you nourishment anymore. You're looking for something else. So that's why you're here. The history that you've got now is false. It's been rewritten mostly over and over again. Right? You're just going to have to accept that. It's lots of rewrites just like Hollywood. But there was a time when there was true law, true law of love, and there were teachers that came and taught that. And they said very clearly what was going to happen and what was likely to happen if humanity didn't change. If you kept following the money lenders, the slave traders, with their false religions and all that kind of stuff, where it was going to go. What you have is basically this. And this goes back to a very old, old story. And some of you might find this uncomfortable, some of you may not, or some of you may agree. But as far as my researches can, can work out, we are um, genetically created vehicles. We have these genetically created vehicles. And they were created by beings that, shall we say, were fallen, i.e. they didn't have souls. And we were meant to be their slaves. But there was a trick that was paid on them that they hate us for because... It turns out, after they had us being their slaves, being really willing and loving and all the rest of it, they suddenly realized, hold on, these guys have got an aspect of the divine with them. These guys have got a soul. We haven't. And that's why they hate us. And these people, if you want to put it in a psychological term, or these beings, or because I'm not interested, I don't even care if you're a reptilian alien. I'm only interested in one thing. 
I don't care if you're black, white, yellow, wherever you come from, I'm only interested in one thing and that's the quality of your consciousness. What is it that's inhabiting the vehicle you're, you're inhabiting? Where's that at? Where does that want to be? Where does that want to go? That's what really matters when you get through all that divisive stuff. That's what's really important. You know, we really need to, to just focus simply on that. I met this lovely girl today, young, beautiful, chatty girl. She was Greenpeace. I said to her, you're selling. Yeah. She said, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm working for Greenpeace. I'm doing something good. The, the pollution and all the other stuff, the, the, government, the government aren't doing anything, and so we and Greenpeace are doing it. I said, I bet you feel good about that. She said, yeah. I said, but somewhere along the line, you're going to ask me for a bank account, aren't you? And she went, yeah. I said, you're selling. I said, the guys that create this world the way it is with all its pollution are the banksters and the moneylenders. You're working for them. You're selling for them. You're getting work for them. And you're feeling good about it, aren't you? Look how clever they are. Religion, there's two authorities to get law from. One is from the divine and the other is from the consent of the people. God made us the trustee and we've got the consent of the people because nobody's arguing with us. Therefore, what we say goes. And if you don't, we can use force to stop you. You don't have to consent. Even Theresa May says, we have a police force in this country, we are policed by consent. Let me just go through this very quickly. There's two things to a police constable. That's two things. Police, the term police comes from policy. The policy man is enforcing the policies of the Crown Corporation of which you are a citizen, which means worker, which means slave, and you've handed your will and your life over to that. Constable is something completely different. A constable has sworn an oath, which means he's in his honour, to prevent a breach of the peace. That's all he's there for. So he's got two roles. Now, if you said to them, I don't recognise you as a policy enforcement officer, but I do recognise you as a constable, and you will honour your oath. If you refuse to honour your oath, then under common law, you've committed perjury. That's a common law offence. If you swear an oath and you go back on that oath, that's a common law offence. If he insists, after you've rebutted that, and said you don't want to do it, and you haven't given a name and address or anything like that, or contracted, and he still insists to, to fine you, because you can't fine even under English law, you have to have a court de jure, a jury as well, he still does that. He's then committed fraud which is another common law offence. The maximum penalties for perjuries, I believe, is 25 years, and fraud is 25 years as well. <laughs> those are common law offences, and he's sworn an oath to uphold those. So if you go along to the police station and say to the sergeant, I have not contracted with this guy, the proof that I haven't contracted is he hasn't got my name and address. Do you want to add kidnap to that? Because he's committed perjury, is attempted to commit fraud, are you going to kidnap me until I give you something that isn't my property? Because that name isn't my property. In other words, you're asking me to give you something that isn't my property. As a police officer, do you think that's a good thing to do? <laughs> if I, I'll, I'll wind up. My intention was to stimulate you guys to do some research. I, I hope that that's what, what you've done. Thank you very much.